Rachel, it's been a day and I'm already sick of turkey. I, I, no more turkey. Make it go away. Why, why do we have to have turkey after Christmas? Make it stop. I mean, the royal family are swan. Well, fine. Serve swan, but uh, it's Boxing Day and uh, it's only been a day, but already I'm sick of turkey. Please, make it make it stop. I, I'd, I'd love to, but I think you've got at least another two or three days yet. Have you had the curried turkey? <coughs> No, no, I think I think that comes at some point in this uh, mystical me- place where time has no mean- meaning, you know, this, 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 this undefined period of time, perhaps what one, one might say a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. That work as a segue. People know what we're I, talking I about. I think that's a good segue. I mean, if people yeah. don't know by now, then um, go back and listen to yesterday. Uh, sorry, yes. it's Christmassy. Yes, but that was the only Christmassy one. Today's Boxing Day where I'm just complaining about Turkey. But I will say today's film was very much a Boxing Day film when I was growing up. This is a film that would often be on ITV on Boxing Day. Oh, yes. This is this is the good one. The Empire Strikes Back. The, uh, the despecialised editions, if you're, if you're playing a longer time, that's what we're listening to or watching. But honestly, if you're watching the special editions, uh, there's, there's not a huge amount of difference. We'll talk about some of those when we're going on. But... To you, Rachel, this is once again your first time watching the despecialized editions. What do you think? What, 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 what do we think has Empire? Does, does it warrant the high office and esteem to which it is held? So I'm going to be really honest. I don't think I could tell the difference between this and the specialized edition. There were no bits in this where I was like, oh, wow, that's different slash not in it, blah, blah, blah. I think there's some extra bits added in Cloud City maybe in the special editions. Probably some the, the, the two, more the two layering. Big the two big differences... Uh, I, I feel in terms of what you get in the special edition content wise is there's more of the wampa in the special edition because they yes. they show a guy in a suit and you can kind of see the monster in it all its glory what have you and um there's also in in cloud city they digitally paint in windows in places so it just seems like a much more open space so you kind of get a sense of a city one of the nice things about the despecialized editions we're using is it's kept all of the fixes that were done in terms of cleaning up maps and up resing them to to high def so during the battle of hoff it looks absolutely gorgeous you don't have any of the big black map lines like you had in previous editions it's just we no longer have the editions and i gotta tell you especially with things like the wampa i feel once again this is a better version because it leaves stuff like that to your imagination and I think that's much more powerful. I absolutely agree with you. Oh, it's really boring when we both agree. But I think, yeah. Don't worry, we've got the sequels coming up. I'm sure oh, at that point. <laughs> we can disagree there. I mean, Jar Jar is my favourite. Um, mm-hmm. It's not. Just to put that out there, it's not. That's, that's the turkey talking. Um, but yeah, I think, as you say, when I was watching this, I was surprised at how clean it looked, uh, particularly Force Ghost. Uh, Force Ghost at McGuinness, I was like, oh, wow, he looks really crisp. Um but yeah, I think the fact that it's it's been cleaned up, but it's not been altered. Um, and as we said, the alterations were not huge on this one. It's not like A New Hope where there were substantial changes. Uh, this is still narratively, structurally and visually the same the same film that it was. Yeah. Um, I'm, got, I'm, I, I didn't I got, notice the windows. I've got, I got, got to say, talking about this film. Damn, it's good. Oh. Damn, it's fucking good. <laughs> yeah. I was having that... when Before I sat down to watch it, I was like, okay, it's okay if I don't like this now. Like, it's okay. But I did love it, so it's fine. I'm not that worried anymore. Uh, so, I, I, so, so, so here you go. So, so I think this film is what makes Star Wars what it is today. In, in, in the sense that this is the film that birthed the franchise, much more so than the first film. And secondly... Yesterday we were speaking about how Star Wars, it really is for the first two acts especially, a high fantasy film in a space setting. This is a war film throughout. This is very clearly to me just a war film. Yes, and I think, I don't think when I when I was remembering it before having seen it in a while, I don't think I realised how long we spent on Hoth. I always, you know, as a kid you remember the, the big pew pew space battle bits, uh, but we spend a lot of time with the rebels on Hoth and seeing how fleshed out their bases, you know, it really felt like we were kind of in the trenches uh, in, in warfare as you're waiting for the enemy to arrive. Uh, the other thing that I really noticed and I thought was particularly in this one, 
because it's when we start to get proper ship battles, is how naval it felt, the way they moved the the Star Destroyers particularly. But it felt very seafaring. It felt very much like you'd move a a a, a naval vessel. Um, and I think even down to the sounds they make at points and the the way they they shoot from the side. You know, they have side to side shooty combat as well. I just it slaps. I can't say anything other than that. But before we go any further, I do have to just add an amendment from yesterday where I did get some information wrong. And oh, I feel no we should God. own How up dare. to our mistakes. <laughs> I know. So originally, I said yesterday that the all three of the first movies have a three-year period, or over a three-year period. And I was actually wrong. It is three years in canon between A New Hope and An Empire Strikes Back. Um which was replicating the real world weight for audiences. And then it's four years between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. So just to clear that up, I was I was wrong. I thought, uh, I, I, yeah, I was wrong. And I think that's important because I very much felt like A New Hope and Empire could have taken place. If you told me there'd been a week between those two, I'd have been... Yeah, okay, there's a week between the two. Really? Uh, I, I, I've always felt there was... I mean, w- one thing my takeaway from this was is actually how, how different the characters are compared to who, how we were in Star Wars. And I think that was quite stark, watching a back-to-back like this. That, yeah, they, they I, I seem, agree. That it, it feels almost like that in, in Star Wars, it's, it's first draft, kind of like... It's, it's the concepts of the characters more so. And, and here... They're now fully fleshed out. The banter between them is a lot more... It, it feels a lot more real and authentic. And I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that um, George Lucas isn't directing this one. It's being directed I by Irving Kirshner. I was about to say exactly the same thing. You can yeah. feel George Lucas's story, mm-hmm. but it's like like his rock of an idea has been put in a rock tumbler and smoothed out by by writing teams and directors where I think that's not in the first one. And I think I think I would agree the way characters interact with each other. I think they're more emotive. The dialogue is better. You know, I think it's really apparent that this has gone from one guy making his movie to a team of people working on one guy's idea. And I think I think that massively pays off in yeah. in, in this. And I think all props to the director because visually this film is stunning and it's still stunning today. I mean, I've just watched it on on a frankly ridiculous size screen and it was it was beautiful and I loved it oh yeah it, 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 this, this will absolutely stand up with the best of them even to the day and uh, w- w- once again with uh, I, bec- because there's not as much um, uh, CG post-processing done on the special edition I don't think this also the special edition of this film suffered in the same way that A New Hope did most of what they were adding is uh, I mean, the, the Wampus kind of the Wampa and Cloud City were the biggest additions, and they don't feel quite as jarring as some of the stuff that you get in New, in New Hope. Uh, even the Cloud City stuff, I don't, I don't, I don't lament the loss of of the vistas. If, if anything, it feels more like, it, yeah, you're a city above the clouds, but all you are seeing are clouds up there. I, you know, I wonder if that might be a bit disconcerting. Uh, so I kind of like the kind of stark seventies esque. Uh, it's, it's very kind of Space 99 in terms of how the corridors look there, so I don't buy well, that. Well, I was thinking, We're- actually, a lot of the Cloud City particularly gave me real feelings of, of obviously, his previous uh, science, George Lucas's previous science, which you know, TH-1138, THX-1138, mm-hmm. um, and also kind of Logan's Run and um, uh, uh, the worst of all, uh, Clockwork Orange, those kind of big quite brutalistic stark white vistas that's just that's kind of what it what it gave me which yeah. none of those are particularly positive i guess but that's not the point you know it was it didn't feel like we were missing things it didn't feel like i was missing the vistas because we got that when we flew in we got the big establishing shot and we had it at the end when the millennium falcons flying away you know there was no there was no point where i was like oh i really wish i could just see a bit of the clouds in this so uh, let, let's start at the beginning. As, as you said, uh, the, uh, the opening sequence is at half. Uh, no, no, before we get there. Before we get there? Before the, the opening shot of those Star Destroyers is such a powerful move. It's, oh, yeah. 
the bad guys are here. There's more well, of no, these no, no, damn you ships. See, no, but that comes later. See, you, 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 the, the opening shot of this film, after, after our crawl has disappeared off into the sky, as all the original Star Wars films go, you pan down to reveal a Star Destroyer firing the probe droid, which then flies and lands on Hoth. And then the little probe droid comes again. And then you have Luke introduced on his Tauntaun. You don't get that cool scene until a bit later. It is a very cool scene, but it's not the first scene in the film. Well, no, but the, uh, what I meant is the, the the first thing we see, the first thing after crawl is those star destroyers. Is that star destroyer? You know, the the bad guys are still here. There's still a problem. As we said yesterday, they've won the battle, but they've not won the war. The war is still going, and we're kind of jumped. We're put straight in that point, which I don't think the sequels do at any point. I think we always pan down onto planets or open vistas and stuff like that. We don't quite get the. Uh, the harsh jump in that this film gave us and it was a harsh jump in and there's nothing wrong with that uh, I don't know if I agree on the harsh jump in I, I, I think because this is the first of, of the, the sequel films to, to the original one and, and they're establishing what the, um, the methodology is I mean, I mean I'll say this about Empire and, and the subsequent films with the exception possibly of Revenge of the Sith but we'll get to that is this no longer feels like a Saturday morning serial this no. feels like a grown-up film. And I don't mean an adult film. I'm saying a grown-up film. In, in the same way, when you're a kid, you watch grown-up films because you, know, you feel they give you a sense of self-importance and you know, it's seriousness. That is not what this film is. But it, it, although I was, I was actually surprised at the amount of levity and, and comedic moments in this film going back and watching it, you know, when you're kind of looking out for that, though. But, but it, 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 it treats it with, with a level of seriousness and... Um, uh, I mean, yeah, grown upness really, but but I think was lacking in uh, the first film in Star Wars in A New Hope, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, that opening sequence with the um, when, when you when you see the Empire, you know, the film is called The Empire Strikes Back, and this is setting out. And if you think back to uh, Star Wars, you know, we see the Death Star obviously, which is very impressive, some Tie Fighters, but the most we see in terms of ships is there's two Star Destroyers coming after the Millennium Falcon after it escapes Tatooine. That's the extent of the Starfleet. And here you've got the opening shot of a Star Destroyer. We know the Star Destroyers are big, but something's casting a shadow over it. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you cut back and you've got... I mean, of course, Darth Vader's going to have the biggest blackest ship around there. I mean, that is a power statement right there. I mean, everything about him is a power statement. But yes, this this that particularly is... In, in Star Wars, he's very much... A another bad guy. He, he he's an important bad guy. He's a big cog in the machine, as we said yesterday. But he's not the main man. He he is Tarkin's attack dock. Here he is very much top of that tree. Everyone is cowering to him. And and he straight out he's... murders people throughout this movie and and promotes people, doesn't he? You know, there's a guy who's like, oh yeah, this is kind of my fuck up. I'm going to go tell Lord Vader. And the next shot we I... see of him, he's dead on the floor. But I I, I love how bemused Vader is after that you know he's just choked the guy he's dead and the way he goes apology accepted captain leader <laughs> it's just like oh you thought that was going to end well for you didn't you well there you go um but i i, I mean the level of refinement that vader's gone on to it, 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 his, his costume is refined no longer the kind of rough and ready it's, it's polished to a high sheen his helmet that is my first note i've made about vader on my list is that he looks like the vader i imagine Hmm. His, his, his helmet has been well polished euphemism um, also but this is the film when I think they started painting the, the mask uh, black and silver rather than just black so it feels like it's very reflective even when that's not the case um, it's got black eye lenses instead of just the red lenses but uh, James Earl Jones' delivery is so much more it, it's so more measured he, he never feels like he's losing his cool he, he never feels like he's rushed or hurried he's impatient he, he will not suffer fools but he always feels like he's in control oh absolutely and i think without wanting to jump to the end that's very much how i feel his cat and mouse chase with luke is in the final sequences vader is in control of that whole thing at no point does luke have the upper hand there is no hint here that luke is going to achieve because vader is domineering and in control of everything. The reason Luke is not cut into a thousand tiny pieces by Vader's lightsaber is because Vader doesn't want that. He's toying with him. And oh, I think so that, much. So much. <laughs> and I think the performance put in is great. And again, back to 
stellar directing to to get those performances out of these characters who didn't have this in the first place you know in the first film they do not have that uh you know that level of of finesse to them it really i think i find it really start watching them back to back how unpolished a new hope is and how I can I can almost now understand why George Lucas has always wanted to go back and tweak it and refine it and do it because it's not up to the same standard. No, it's not. But the problem is, it will never be up to to the standard of Empire because the the issues, if if you want to call them issues, I, I don't think they're issues. But you know, it's just a New Hope is effectively a director and and crew finding their way and and understanding how to do stuff for the first time. This is a refinement. You're refining the idea and and that's why it's just so much better and we see the same in other franchises as well you see the same in star trek you know the motion picture well i love that a lot of people don't but a lot of what's in that film is then refined further down and distilled down into what you get in wrath of khan which is a you know arguably much more uh a superior film very different tones we're not going to go into star trek we'll save that for next year but I, i wanted to just touch upon with um you know, while, while we're there with Vader and the Starfleet, you mentioned earlier how, how much more naval they are. I, I think that kind of feeds back into, again, this idea of this is just a straight-up war film. There, there is no... There are fantasy elements here in so much as we're still inhabiting the world of Star Wars. But I wouldn't call this a fantasy. I, this is definitely science fiction over science fantasy in terms of structure and, you know, the sense of the world there. You know, you have... A, a, a structure to the ships you have captains you have admirals you have things which are recognisable there with the exception of the lightsabers and the force there's not really any kind of um, mysticism in the same way you had in the first one there's no talk of Jedi's being a religion no that's 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 disappeared quite quickly and mm. and I can't argue with anything you've said because I agree. Um, I, I would also say there's no hint of this being a Western in this film either. Like, we lose the Western kind of influence completely, mm-hmm. um, which partly, I assume, is is down to, you know, it's now the 80s, things, you know, we've we've moved quite far away from that kind of heyday of the Westerns, and this is for, for a different audience. Um, I didn't miss any of that at all. I noticed its absence because I was there looking for it, but it was... Yeah, this is this is the war film that this is the war film of Star Wars out of the two we've watched. Uh, yes, <laughs> of, of, of the two we've watched, this one is more like a war film than the other one. Yeah. And I can't <laughs> imagine them trying to make it any different. I don't know how you would improve it by doing anything different. You know, well, by adding more of those Western elements or more of the elements from the first film. This film works because it's it's treated as a war film. Yeah. Uh, and it goes at a clip. I, I mean, from, from the moment that the, uh, the Star Destroyers arrive in the Hoff system uh, to the moment when the Millennium Falcon disappears inside the asteroid, I mean, it doesn't let up at all. It is there's, there's a lot of tension going on there, and it's going along quite a clip. The music absolutely magnificent. John Williams. I mean, I'd argue that the asteroid chase is is perhaps one of his finest works, a- alongside, of course, uh, Imperial March, the iconic Star Wars track. And it's used but, quite a few times in this as well. Well, it, it, it's, it's, it is the theme of, of Darth Vader and of the Empire, and they are a big presence within this film, aren't they? Exactly. And I think oh, I, I, you can never go wrong with the John Williams score, but I think it really comes out on, into its own in this. Um, and also the, 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 the Han and Leia theme, or the Leia theme, uh, in their first kind of uh, difficult conversations in the corridors of Hoth, um, you know that was it was it was I, by modern standards we call that quite heavy-handed, uh, but it was really nice to hear that kind of little little floret. I mean, it's, I mean the dynamic between Han and Leia as well is 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 fantastic. You know, it it it, it feels believable. I'm invested in it. It doesn't feel contrived like they're being forced to. It, into that thing you can kind of see how two people working together closely under that sort of stressful circumstances would organically come together despite reservations on both so sides so i have a question for you based on okay. han and leia okay re-watching this now i think i have a different interpretation to before he clearly has feelings for her through this movie and yes. that's not particularly well hidden and he knows she feels the same about him or he suspects i get 
or the way I interpret it now is she is unaware of her feelings through this movie or this movie is her coming to the to the realizations of her feelings for Han Solo um and when she says, I love you at the end, him saying, I know, for me now hits quite differently uh, because that is him agreeing with her. You know, it, it's her her acknowledging her realised feelings and him kind of going, I've always known. I know he says, I know. Uh, how, how do you interpret that now? That's That's definitely how it now feels to me, maybe as an adult and, you know, with thinking about these things. What about you? I, I, I just think that... That's one of the greatest lines in, in all of Star Wars is the I know. It's iconic. Um, and, you know, obviously, obviously you, you read the stories behind the scenes about how Han was supposed to say something, you know, em- emotional or mushy or, you know, kind of to, to try and convey all of his feelings. And he just goes, I can't, I can't say all that. All Han would say is I know. And I think that's what it boils down to. I, I, I think w- what you have there is is a, a, a situation where Leia, as, as a princess, as a... Uh, a former senator as a high-ranking member of the Alliance who is focused on the destruction of the Empire will not allow herself to to have feelings and relationships. She wants to be focused on, on the job, on the mission. You know, you, you can talk there about this sense about how, you know, especially being a woman, one of the only women in... I, I think... The, no, there's one other woman in this film. But basically... It, it, is it's there, very, though? Well, she's in the background. But yeah, it's very much a case of... They're there to, you know, to, to, to win this war. And I have no time for anything else. And I'm focused purely on this. And she's becoming increasingly irritated that she's having these feelings for Han. Uh, and she's like, no, I, I cannot afford this time for myself. I cannot be selfish and, and take this moment for myself, uh, what have you. Han, I think, is, I, I think it starts off as, as flirting, as a bit of fun. And over time, over the four years or what have you, you know, it's, it's gone to the point now where he definitely has feelings which he's probably not comfortable with himself because, you know, he's a scoundrel. He's a, uh, you know, he has a girl in every port. He's, he's not really looking for uh, a meaningful relationship there, but, you know, that's just where he is now. And when he says, I know, to her saying, I love you, it's because there's no way he can encapsulate all of his feelings and say all that has been unsaid in that moment. And, and I think... You know, her saying "I love you" is is saying mountains, and him saying "I know" is an acknowledgement of that, and an acknowledgement. But he that- says it with such gravitas, though. It's not "I know." It's it's no, but I know it's, got no, it's got none of his cheekiness to it, and that's why I love it because it does have all that meaning and all that that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're we're aggressively agreeing with each other. Ah, this is no good. Let, let, let's just cut straight to the sequel trilogy. No, so I I feel that. Uh, look, this is, uh, you know, it's like the story also where in Indiana Jones, when you know, Indiana Jones comes out uh, and faces a guy with the, the, the sword and he's swinging it around and doing all this sort of stuff and Han just shoots, uh, uh, Indy just shoots him because, you know, I ain't got time for this. It's, it's one of those sort of moments of improvisation. It's Harrison Ford knowing the character, knowing what needs to be said and, and having a better insight into it than the director or writer does in that moment and knows in that moment this is what Han would say. And it is perfect. Could not agree more. I friggin' love the Battle of Hoth. Oh yeah, it's it's it is once again it's a straight up war movie. It, you know, it's an action sequence. You've got the, um, the the rebel troops all kind of in their trenches, running forwards, cocking their guns, and then off in the distance through the macro binoculars, you just hear a boom, 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 and then you've got these walkers coming towards you. And even now, it's what forty. <sighs> It's got to be 44 years since this film came out. They still look absolutely stunning. Zero notes. Just perfect. The proportions are perfect. The way they move is perfect. The, the They're sense terrifying. Of, they really are. I mean, they are terror weapons. They are completely impractical. They exist solely to terrorise. And you know what? Absolutely work. Can you imagine being in a trench and just seeing those things coming towards you and nothing well, you, you can do to see, fire at you'd them? You'd feel it first, right? It oh, would yeah. be like the, the, the T-Rex in... Um, Jurassic Park it's the same you feel it before you see it and yeah just ah oh, I the walkers are I think if you say there is one thing that comes out of each movie one kind of iconic thing it's it's lightsabers from a new hope for me it's the walkers from the empire strikes back you know that mm-hmm. one kind of thing that's like I I cannot think of anything that sums that up more 
than this. We don't really see him again. <laughs> uh, you see, there, there is one in Return of a Jedi, but yeah, you, you don't really see him again. And, and in every other film, when they've tried to, to, to make use of walkers, they just haven't had that same level of impact. I also think it has a lot to do with the setting, the location, you know, that, that, that you know, icy plateau there on Hoth, where they're coming towards you, but the starkness of it. And it, it, it's just the sense of these 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 rebels who are ants before this on, onslaught uh, you know trying everything and it's just absolutely meaningless i love the whole sequence though with the um the speeders going in uh trying mm-hmm. to line up and getting the tow cables on there it's so well done and it's such low-fi low-tech solutions to problems and i know the always a joke is oh you can you know take down a walker by tying its legs together but You've got to get close enough to tie those legs together. And there's a lot of precision in that. And it's, it's a very low-key solution because none of their high-tech solutions, none of their ion cannons and stuff are going to do anything. You know, it's it's guerrilla warfare. And I know we always think of Return of the Jedi as kind of the guerrilla warfare film because, they, they, you know, they, they fight with sticks in the forest. But I think the Battle of Hoth is, for me, has a lot of kind of guerrilla warfare aspects. It's got a lot of Vietnam in it. And I don't think you can can hide that at all or i don't think you can deny that you know with the the low-tech solutions that's not about winning but about staving them off so people can escape and i've got in my notes in big letters i've got i love it when they shoot the first ion cannon (laughs) because i do because the 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 giant booby fired yeah (laughs) but it's such it's a gun that you know, does it doesn't damage the, the the star destroyers? It incapacitates them temporarily so they can escape. So even their biggest, most powerful weapon cannot take down the Empire. No, but I love how arrogant that guy is as well. He goes, "You know, good, our first catch of the day." I mean, it's just like, I mean, you know, Vader's going to kill that guy. <laughs> oh yeah, he's he's on the floor with the other one. Ah, Admiral. <laughs> dead um but yeah hoth the whole thing on hoth i love the the kind of the kind of dog fighting with the snow speeders around the very kind of the legs of the the walkers and ah it's so good well, I, I love i love the set for echo base as well it feels like a real hanger the sound effects the people working on Do you know the, what it makes uh, me think block? of what's that submarines uh, yeah, I can see that with the corridors there. Also, when you know the um, the walkers are approaching, you've got the shake and the dust mm-hmm. coming down there, um, and the, the control room where they've got the big plastic boards and they're plotting on there. It it it, it, it feels lived once in. again. It, it feels lived in. Everything here feels real. That it's tactile. It, it feels like every switch works and they can press it. Uh, and that's something that I think is is definitely going to be missing when we get to a prequel trilogy you don't have that that sense of realism it comes back to something we said yesterday there's a sense of weight to this world that i think is lacking and i think that's especially apparent uh, when you get to the industrial areas of cloud city it feels like a, an oil derrick or something there's, there's something about it it just feels like a, a real place absolutely so what i think is really interesting what we've done so far is we've spoken lovingly about cloud city and we've spoken lovingly about Hoth. How can we not speak lovingly about Hoth? Uh, we haven't spoken about the middle. No, we haven't. Uh, Dagobah, which has always been the bit I'm iffiest about, is Dagobah. It's not that it's bad. Okay, look, I'm just going to say it. I'm just going to say it. I don't like Yoda. I don't mind Yoda. I, I actually quite like Yoda. I, I, I like what the character is and what he's trying to do. I like how he's performed. I think Frank Oz is fantastic. And I think he's best in this film with that slightly mischievous streak. I, I think I, I, one of the things that I disliked is how they gave Yoda such a reverent personality in in later appearances to that he is, you know, he, he's, he's, like, he's like Jesus amongst the Jedi, which really does contrast against this. And does, it, it doesn't have any of that sense of fun. But did you have here? I would here? say the last Jedi gives him that sense of fun again. Yes, but I was talking about the prequels. Oh uh, yes, the last the, Jedi uh, came yes. after. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It's set after this. My, my, my point is though, when you see J- Yoda, you know th- th- this idea that Yoda is is because imagine how mind blowing that would have been coming into this and not knowing this. If if you want to think of Jedi Master, could there be anything further from? 
your imagination of what Yoda presents himself as in that moment. You know, crawling into his ration crate sort of thing and then fighting R2 with his walking stick. Going, no, mine, mine, mine. I will I will agree with all that. I just, Yoda as a character has never gelled with me and maybe that's because I actually had prequels Yoda uh at a more formative age than than original series Yoda um, but he just I, I want to say it's the weak point of the film because that's wrong because none of it's weak and I definitely and it does, it, 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 there is one moment in the Dagobah sequence which I think is incredibly powerful and that's the moment when Luke goes into the cave which I think is just oh, yeah. it, it, it tells you nothing and it tells you everything I think that's magic they have never been able to recreate in the Star Wars series however well, hard they tried I think it came- I think they came very close in The Last Jedi. And look, we'll talk about this when we get to The Last Jedi, but let me ask you this, okay? This film is so tonally different to Star Wars, like the first film, A New Hope, whatever you call it. I, I mean, could this film be any more different to that first film? And could you imagine this coming out in, in this day and age with the media landscape the way it is, the reaction to Empire Strikes Back compared to what we had there? I mean, I mean just seeing Yoda as a great Jedi and, and being presented as that. Can you imagine? Well, it would be the woke left gone mad, I assume. It would be the end of Star Wars. It, it, it's just, this film is is so different to the first Star Wars film. Well, it had a bit of a backlash at the time for being different. Like, reviews at the time, people were like, oh, wow, this is <laughs> this is not your fun, you know, Flash Gordon knockoff that the first one was. This is... No, uh, I mean, I, 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 was, I wasn't alive at this point, so I, I, I couldn't comment. <laughs> well, no, based, based on research, I, I was also not around. But there were definitely articles and things that, that kind of went, oh, wow, this is this is very different. This is a more adult film, as, as we've said. Um, no, and no, it's I think, not an adult film. It's a grown-up film. Yes. I, think, I, I do think there's a distinction to be made there. And I'm not talking about adult in a kind of a explicit sense. I just think, I don't think this is a film aimed at adults, but I think it's a film that's more grown up. I can imagine if you'd gone to the cinema, you know, all excited, queued up after A New Hope and this was a film, I can imagine coming out and feeling feeling quite a whiplash maybe or, you know, quite despondent about it and maybe having to sit with it and and come back round to it, you know, come back to, to positive feelings about it. It is certainly to my understanding or to my... Uh, point in life uh you know always been seen as the best out of the original three mm-hmm. but that's as you say this this is widely regarded as the best of the star wars films it's it's still held up as a, as a masterpiece rightly so i think it, it's a bit slower in the middle with the yoda stuff but i think if you went straight from the hoff stuff to the cloud city stuff I you think can't you break keep your that neck. up you, well, you, you need to have the the quiet moment in in between. You need that moment of contemplation, reflection. We need to get Luke from running away without telling his friends where he's off to from the Hoff system to coming back to rescue them. And we need to see him going up against Vader, very cocksure. You know, he's a Jedi now. You know, he's he's trained under he's done Yoda. His ten minutes of training, he's done. Yeah, he, raise he's the done next thing. Done. He, could, he didn't know, uh, but he can stand on his head. You know, he can he can do he's he's cocksure, he knows what he has to do. Uh, and I mean that fight between and this I still think that this is the best lightsaber fight. Certainly in the original trilogy, in terms of narrative weight and potential there. This feels like there's so much storytelling going on in, in this fight. And it's just in every moment, the way that you know, the lights come on and then you hear Vader and he goes, the force is with you, young Skywalker, but you are not a Jedi yet. And then Luke ignites his lightsaber. He's poised, he's ready, he's confident. And the way Vader just casually brings his lightsaber up to meet his and then just bats it away. And, really and you nonchalant, say, isn't it? It's like, oh, yeah, all right then, we'll Vader do this. knows he has nothing to worry about here. Nothing at all. He is toying with this kid for shits and giggles basically it's a case of yeah come on and he even says as much when when he tricks him into the thing he goes perhaps the emperor was mistaken <laughs> you know <laughs> until he he jumps out of it there and and, and the, just the the power of the performance from from david prowse as, as the body suit and from james l jones providing the voice and uh, there was another person who was doing the actual fight choreography as vader in the suit at this point but they all come together 
And, and it's I just, don't think you get any sense that that's not all one person. No, no, you don't. You, you fully buy into this being Vader. And also, can we just take a moment to acknowledge Darth Vader is a dramatic bitch who will hold his breath for a dramatic reveal? Because there's one moment in particular where he suddenly comes out from behind a corridor and his breathing starts and he's he's breathing hard because he's been holding his breath until Luke turned up. And I just love that. I think we get some of that in the prequels, though. Some of that kind of dram- dramaticism, dramaticness. Oh, oh Anakin that... is a dramatic son bitch, but but this is the first time we're seeing this out of Vader. This is the first time. I mean, this is really the first time we're seeing any kind of personality outside of Vader, outside of him being a a, a monster. And, and and you see it. Um, we we see he's impatient. He will not suffer fools. We we see the way he he threatens people without threatening them. You know. The way he, you know, after he's killed the, for Admiral Ozzel and promotes Captain Piet to Admiral, Admiral Piet, uh, and then later on he goes, do not fail me again, Admiral. How much threat is in that word Admiral that you just, you, every, everyone knows what he's talking about there. And as I said earlier, when he kills Captain Nida, he's amused. He is amused that someone thought coming to him with bad news personally would spare him what is coming. Get my shuttle ready. Him. I'll tell Lord Vader myself. Oh, he had a death wish. Maybe oh, yeah, that's. Yeah. It, it, I hope did he write a suicide note beforehand? Because that's. I thought that was very clear. I mean, maybe that's because we know what's happening, but I don't think there was any. I don't know any way I that he thought that was going to go that wasn't death. I have no, I have no idea, but but, but that that was. It, it, it was interesting. We we also see uh, when um, on, on Cloud City, you know, what's more dramatic? Vader he sets a dinner t- setting sort of thing and go. We would be honoured if complete you would join with food us and dinner. cups and plates and everything. Oh yeah, I'd like to believe he actually sat down and had dinner before he went and took uh, Han off for a little little bit fun in the kinky time. Yeah, more torture in this movie. I always forget there's so much torture in the original uh, Star Wars movies because there's torture in obviously a New Hope. They torture Leia, and then we get some a little bit of a little bit of solo torture going on in this one. You know, but but again, that's taking it back to a war film, isn't it? You know, war is here to to not make great great warriors but but traumatized people for the rest of their lives and i certainly feel like our characters are being traumatized mm-hmm. horribly in this film well this is this is the film where they don't they do not win at the end of this film. At the end of the first film they won the battle you know there was a sense of hope in the galaxy they got their nice medals uh, at the end of this film you know this is very much a dunkirk moment i mean okay yes most of us have gotten away with our lives but we didn't win. most of us yeah well, obviously, Han has gone off to go and be a wall decoration there. Uh, so, so, so here's it. Here you go. Uh, so, so, what are your thoughts of the first black man uh, in in the Star Wars universe? I never used to like Lando, and the more I, well, when I rewatch these, the more I kind of like Lando as a character. I think he's he's complex, possibly one of the most complex characters. Mm. He's certainly the most complex of the new characters we get in this movie, um, and I think he. He very quickly becomes toe to toe with with Leia and that, and I think, I think I also was either unaware or had forgotten how much of a main character he is in this movie, and I'm, I can't remember how much he's in the next one. I guess I'll find out tomorrow. Uh, but I, I I love where he sits, how he's he kind of takes that space that Han Solo was in, but doesn't replace Han Solo. Could, well, you say that. Can we just take a moment to acknowledge that at the end of this film, he's literally wearing Han Solo's costume from Star Wars. Look, I he's don't wearing know what... the vest and the shirt. I don't know what Chewie's into, but he looks after his pets well, who fly his ship. So <laughs> I think he was a great casting choice. I think he's a great addition. Um, and I, I really like Lando. Lando Carizian, way more than I ever did previously. I, I ever really never thought I did. I really like Lando in this film. And I, I like the suggestion of the history that, you know, is there. You know, I, I like when they're landing there. There's a sense of, oh, he's an old friend of ours. Um, you know, maybe, oh, no, that was a long time ago. I'm sure he's forgotten. But, you know, maybe stack, get ready in case we have to get away from him in a, they're here in a hurry. And, and the way Lando comes out and it kind of does the double bluff. Um, you know, then we see they're all friends. Uh, you know, we, we know there's a relationship between Han, Chewie, and, and Lando. We know that Lando apparently used to own a Falcon. <laughs> I'm sure when we get to Solo, we can revisit whether or not it was yeah. a good idea to extrapolate on, on, on all that. But I, I definitely feel a lot more sympathetic to Lando and the position he is in than 
would have been previously because he really doesn't have any choice. You know, Boba Fett shows up with the Empire in tow beforehand. What, what are your options here? Your options are do what they want or, well, Vader is going to leave a garrison on Cloud City and you're probably going to end up dead. I And I think that's something I definitely felt more watching it now. But again, I've probably not watched this movie in at least a decade. Um, in fact, the last time I probably watched this movie was in preparation to watch uh, The Force Awakens. So... Wow. Ouch. Mm. Um, oh, enjoy feeling old there. Um, but I think the complexity of Lando and yeah, what what decision did he have? What choice did he have? You know, the biggest, baddest dude in the entire galaxy just rocked up looking for your your estranged friend who's also on the way. What are you going to do? Shut the door in their face. There's there's no way you can you can make that, you know. I think he does, and I think the mere fact that he chooses to defy Vader is huge in its own right. And the fact that he he chooses to to kind of not join the rebels, but although, although he does, but well, he chooses, doesn't really have a choice at that point, does he? No, but the <laughs> fact that he he chooses to defy Vader, and I think I love some dialogue between Vader and Lando, where where Vader's you know. Um, take the princess and the Wookiee to my ship and Lando's you know well you said they'd be left in the city under my supervision I'm and Vader's- altering the deal pre- <laughs> yeah. I don't alter it further <laughs> exactly and it's the menace in Darth Vader there you know and yet Lando still chooses to you know double cross Vader and free them and you know that's 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 some pretty pretty big moves there. Well, and I think at that point, but I, I think by the time we'd gotten to that point, I think Lando had finally twigged that he just was not. There, there was no scenario here where he was going to escape with the freedom for him or the city, because because you know already you know they've changed the deal. They're giving Han over to the um, to the bounty hunters. You know now they're taking. Um, Leah, you know, it's clear to Lando at that point that the Empire's never leave, leaving Cloud City, and that's why he sends the messages and gets everyone to evacuate the city. So I think he was perhaps hoping, as you go along, that Vader would honour the, the agreement that was broached. But it, that was never going to be the case. But I don't think uh, Lando really had any option but to go along, especially as a you know the, the administrator slash governor of that facility. I mean, w- what choice do you have? And he's making the right choice for his people or the people mm. that he is the ward of. And yeah, I think I think there's a lot of... I guess, for me personally, there's been a lot of love gained for Lando in this film. I anticipate it all to disappear by the time we get to a solo story. Oh, I, I, mean, I mean, yeah, well, we, <laughs> I, I certainly have thoughts about Lando's appearance we're, in Rise of Skywalker. We're, but, uh, <laughs> we're, we're days away from that. It's fine. It's fine. We're days away. Uh, we, oh, we, so, so, so far We've got far time away. to enjoy Lando. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but I think he's he's great in this. Um, I, I love the uh, you know seeing the interactions between like Chewie and and three PO is a lot of fun. Three PO is a lot of fun in this film. I really like three PO in this film. It's like they gave him a completely different personality, and I love it. I don't know if they gave him a different personality, but they've given him more to do and more to interact with. You know, previously, all he really spoke to was um, R two and Luke. Whereas here, the dynamic between him and, and Han w- was awesome. And just some of the little background dialogue, like when they're, where they're walking out and uh, they're talking about how, well, don't blame me, I just commented it was freezing in the princess's room. Well, how are we going to dry out all her clothes? Which I, ju- I just love imagining w- what's gone on there. You know, 3PO said something, R2's taken it upon himself to turn the heating on in an ice cave, and now everything's very, very wet. And I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> and... I think where Artie works particularly well in this film is the fact that he's not uh, he's not got a set job. In the first one, he's very much uh, the pilot for the story. At least, you know, he's that's how MacGuffin we get to look. <laughs> he is the MacGuffin. Well, he's, he's the companion of the MacGuffin delivery. He's not even the MacGuffin himself. Mm. Um, and this film, I think, because he doesn't have a set job, he is the snarky friend. Uh, sat in the room isn't he going like oh yeah well uh, yeah mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think I think it's really funny that he gets taken apart <laughs> and put back together um, with his weird lamp eyes which I've uh, yeah mm. yeah as I said there's a lot of comedy in in this film which yeah, obviously I've, I've seen this film many times but you know 
straight after the, the, watching the previous one to this one, I can't think of any moments in in A New Hope that were like deliberate comedy beats. Whereas in here, you have these moments, like with the uh, the interaction when um, Leia kisses Luke, which is definitely not going to ca- cause issue later on at all. Uh, well, hold and, on. Uh, we get, we'll come back to that because the movie ends in a slightly strange way for Luke and Leia as well. Um, but yeah, there's there's the kiss. You're right. There's also the bit where she's being dragged off by stormtroopers and she keeps reappearing around the doorway, which would be cheesy in literally any other setting, but kind of worked okay here where she's just going, it's a trap. Look, well, it's a trap. It, 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 it's, it's funny how we never see that meme to death like Akbar. I don't think that's a comedy moment, but th- there's definitely there's a moment when, free, when R2 falls into the swamp in Dagobah. And, and Luke's like, R2! And then you just get his little periscope pops up and he's just like, do, 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 and uh, R2, that way. And <laughs> just great and, little visual sight gags there. But also the the, the, the written, the, the uh, as we're saying, C-3PO, I think particularly, you know, uh, his line's like, uh, don't worry, Master Luke, I'm sure he'll be all right. He's quite clever, you know, for a human being. Yeah. It's, <laughs> the, the snark is... You know, there. Oh, and just the when, stuff the, when the asteroids, like, well, when the, when they start to realise it's not an asteroid, and he goes, "Sir, I, it's quite possible that this asteroid is not entirely stable," as they're literally being shaken around, like, you oh. know. I mean, how good is that entire sequence of the asteroid field? You know, when they dive into it, but, but, you know, you, you get that awesome moment when. Uh, you know they're being chased by the Star Destroyer and, and Han just goes well at least I can outmaneuver them and they just dive straight down and you've got the great moment where the Star Destroyer suddenly go take your face of action and have to um, jump on the brakes but that whole sequence flying through the asteroid field there the music the tempo the, the dialogue the effects everything just comes together in just such a perfect moment it, it is absolutely spectacular to this day I think the asteroid sequence gets really lost in this film, not because it's not good, but because it's bookended by Cloud City and Hoth. And if that that sequence had been in the first film or the third film, I think we would have spent as long talking about it as we have the other bits in the film. Mm. Yeah. No, uh, it, it's entirely possible. I, I just think this film as a whole is a great example of why collaboration in, in filmmaking is important and why it's important to have people to tell you no. Because I think what Ooh. you can see here is you have a situation where George Lucas, great story idea. He's got he's got a, a rough sense on, on the overall thing. You've got Lawrence Kasdan with the script. You've got Irving Kirshner on the, um, on, on the directing. And, you know people who are able to push back and who Lucas will listen to produced this, a, a, a great film. Having It's important to have someone with vision. It's important to have someone, you know, with, with kind of a hand on the tiller, but it's also important that you listen to people around them and let them do their job. And I think, I mean, it, it, once again, go back to the whole, I love you, I know. I mean, that's a note from um, Harrison Ford there. And I think it's important that you have that relationship where you do trust the people that you're working with. And I think it could have been really easy for this film, particularly as it was entirely self-funded by Lucas because he didn't want a big studio interfering. I think it could have really easily ended up, like the prequels, um, in a bit of a mess. If you say, if people had not pushed back against him and hadn't said, actually, what about this? If there hadn't been more collaborative storytelling. And as you say, it's it's great he's got that vision, but you can you can feel the collaboration, the collaborative storytelling happening in this film and to, to, to get us to that end point, that very uh, determined but not hopeful end point. We haven't touched upon it, but I feel, I feel we have to. That twist moment. There's a twist. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough. He told me you killed him. No, Luke. I am your father. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. That moment still slaps. It's it's just such a powerful moment. It's so well done. And I think because it's not hinted at at any point, um, I, I was watching out for it in this movie and the last movie, uh, you know, uh, today and yesterday, to see if there was any hints going up to it. Because, you know, sometimes you find out a big reveal and then you go back and rewatch something or reread something and you're like, oh, actually, this is signposted quite well up to this point if you know to look. That is not the case in this. There is no signposting at all that that is the direction that that's going in. And even though you know it's happening, it's still a shock, 
I think. And I and my entire thing, I think even when I probably first saw this movie, I was probably aware of the twist. See, this this, this is why, uh, you know, prior to the, the sequel trilogy coming out, I was always a big proponent of the, um, of the machete cut of, of Star Wars because what you then have is you have, a, you have Star Wars, you have Empire Strikes Back, the revelation that Vader is Anakin and then you flashback and you can kind of see who Anakin was. I honestly think you only really need to go back to Revenge of the Sith. You don't really need to see Phantom Menace or Attack of the Clones. That, that way of telling the story really works. But w- without that, if, if you watch these in chronological order, in, in terms of one, two, three, four, five, six, it robs this moment of so much power. In, in fact, it robs it of all of its power because, yeah, we know. We saw him go, no! at the end of Revenge of the Sith. But this reveal here in, in this moment, as you say, without any warning, without any, any kind of explanation, and yet, it, it you, you, as he says, search your feelings, you know it to be true. And you do. It's like, oh shit, yeah, actually, no, this does make sense. But I also think we, we the gravitas we get is that not only has Luke been lied to his whole life, but even Yoda and Obi-Wan lied to him you know the these his new mm. his new religion lied to him as well so it's not just a case of oh his aunt and uncle never spoke about it or whatever i'm a huge fan of the machete cut for that reason is you don't lose any of the agency of that line you don't lose any of the shock value and even though as you say we know it's happening it's still quite shocking What do, you, what do you think about the line when uh, Obi-Wan says, that boy's our last hope, and, and Yoda cryptically says, no, there is another? In my head, or if this was, I guess, modern filmmaking, he'd say that line and the next shot would be a shot of Leia to kind of hint of who that is. But that doesn't happen in this. There's no kind of the line is said any... There's no indication that you're talking about Leia. You, you, can, almost, you can almost miss that line or forget it happened in the moment because it's such a small throwaway line and then you immediately go to cloud city and you have everything in the revelation of, of vader being there uh i think it's a great setup for for the wider universe but i don't think it has a huge amount of, of impact in in this film i certainly at no point ever stopped and wondered oh i wonder who he's talking about again watching them back to back there's lots of lines like that in the first film where they talk about you know big world stuff that that doesn't happen in these or is kind of irrelevant and it can be very easily for mis- be taken as one of those lines you know well yes the galactic said it blah 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 you know there's as you say it's kind of it's not a line of gravitas in the film it's it's a throwaway line at the end it's a, it's a scene ender isn't it mm-hmm. and there's no kind of long pause there's no revelation or anything there's none of those kind of modern filmmaking techniques that we would expect by that kind of quite clear revelation um yeah none of it happens we just plod on to to cloud city george might have had an idea in the back of his mind but i think if they had that inkling even at this early stage they wouldn't have put the kiss in at the beginning that is absolutely a let's fuck kiss there's there's a and the way luke reacts afterwards (laughs) is is you know the the, the way the way chewy reacks as well it's just like (laughs) So let's let's talk a little bit about Boba Fett. Um, obviously, uh, in in recent years, has rose, risen to new prominence. Um, he's kind of a nobody here, isn't he? I mean, he's a cool costume. I mean, it is iconic. A cool costume does not a character make. He, he's very undeveloped here. He 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 shows up. He says a few lines to Vader, uh, and then he leaves with uh, a, a Han Solo sickle. So didn't he first appear in the holiday special? Yes, he did. Which so, never aired in the UK. Oh, what a shame. So, for me, and I always feel that Boba Fett is a little bit of a a toy grab, you know, because he is different and he is a cool costume. He doesn't do anything. He's a delivery guy. He's a FedEx guy. That's who he <laughs> is. He's FedExing a parcel. I mean, he was smart enough to know that Han was hiding in with a trash... Uh... After it was ejected, so, so so we we can we can count that he's basically more competent than the Imperial Starfleet. I just I don't know, and I think that's a story that I am sad has never been told. How do him and Darth Vader become mates? Vader's put out a call for bounty hunters because you know, you know, you, you get that moment when the the, uh, the admiral's going, we don't need their scum here, you know, un- underneath the guy wearing the uh, 
uh, the, the, the one of the uh, spacesuits from some nineteen. I think it was from space nineteen ninety nine or something. I don't know, but it's it's um, you, you've got this uh, eccentric range of characters. The closest we perhaps get to the, um, the cantina from the first film of, of these, eight, you know, the bounty hunters there, and he just kind of stops next to to Boba Fett and says, "No disintegrations," uh, suggesting there's some background there. But other than that, we don't really have any sense. No, no. So my last point on Boba Fett is I I've never found him a great character, but he's a great toy because he fulfills the maskless person for you to input your your you know he's the mary sue a little bit you know and i don't think in every iteration we get of him he doesn't get any cooler yeah he, he's he's not servo by knowing more about his backstory in in much the same but you know we could say that about um young anakin skywalker but uh, again, and maybe we and, will <laughs> in two films' time. Discussions and choices to be made made later on. But yeah, I mean, I mean, all, all in all, this film still absolutely stands up as a a, a masterpiece in. Uh, is, this is a masterpiece in film. This is it's a fantastic film. And this film primes up a sequel so well. You know, we've everyone's got their missions. We know what's happening. It's not a big. It could have easily ended with a to be continued as Luke falls through the hole in the floor, having lost his arm, finding out Darth Vader with his father. And it didn't. It had the guts to go that little bit further. I set don't think up you could have ended it like that. You could not have ended it like that. <laughs> they could have tried. But, you know, it, 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 it didn't end on a cliffhanger, is my point. It's everyone knows what they're off to do next they've rounded off this bit we're ready to go into the next act it's a it's a sensible point to end it not a a duff duff moment or anything like that there's it doesn't I mean, it's quite end a on... contrast to how star wars ends though you know which was a very hopeful end you know it as i said yesterday you could have ended star wars and never done another film with it and that would have been a satisfying end to it this does have a a, a solid ending. It, it, it ends very well with that moment of them standing, looking out at the medical frigate. Han heading off to go and find uh, Lando. Han's heading not off going to go anywhere. <laughs> Lando heading off to go and find Han and, uh, and and everything there. But you know, this is very much this is this is part one of a two part story. It, 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 and, and I think that's kind of a key thing here. This isn't part two of a three part story. This is part one of a two part story. I would agree. And having watched it in the way we've watched it, I would. I definitely feel the same. Mm. And I want to go um, and watch Return of the Jedi now. Yeah. Uh, also, I just wanted to, uh, just to acknowledge, you know, what, what a bang up job. We touched upon it earlier on, but, uh, you know, the actors are much more defined. And, and I, I, I feel, for me, definitive Han, Luke and Leia is, is this film. This, this oh, is yeah. perhaps my favourite uh, incarnation of these characters. Oh, yeah. This is the one... It may not give us as many long-term iconic star wars things that we like there's more iconic lines in a new hope the, a new hope gives us a lot of the the lightsabers and the stormtroopers and all kind of that's the visually but this this bakes the formula for star wars and bakes the the concept of star wars as a as a property forevermore for better or for worse i guess uh as we watch these 11 films we might say it's worse yeah, I don't know if we need to come up with some sort of rating system, but uh, I, I, I would certainly put this as a, this is a good one. I, I, I'm, I'm still happy to be doing this project. I am still on board as of as of these two films. So, uh, are you so, going to yeah, say that let's... after a Phantom Menace? We will find out in a couple of days, uh, and we will be back tomorrow in the uh, the wasteland that is the time which exists between Boxing Day and New oh, Year's Day. Oh, the twenty something of December, Mary. Mm. Yeah, exactly. We, we'll be back to talk about Return of the Jedi. Oh, Revenge of the Jedi was such a good title that they never used. 